Welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Gabe Filippelli, and uh, welcome to the future of land and sea in the face of climate change. Um, I'm uh, I'm hoping you've all uh, been looking at the 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 lectures that were put up, the talks put up by our our panelists, a phenomenal set of panelists, quite diverse. And the goal of this particular webinar is to explore climate change in um, I think human sustainability from a number of different dimensions. So um, Andrea Dutton uh, discussed uh, science communication, particularly revolving around climate change and sea level uh, rise. Uh, and Chris Free then uh, discussed climate change impact on fisheries. Uh, and, and as he re reported on his uh, his talk that the tremendous uh, resources, global resources uh, that fisheries provide for food consumption. Uh, and uh, as Barry Sinero talked about uh, organismal uh, decline and ways to deal with that organismal decline uh, and extinction of a number of them. And finally, uh, Paul Schramm uh, discussed how we develop tools to uh, make cities and municipalities and states uh, more resilient to climate change, uh, particularly as it focuses on on human health. And in fact, um, in a sense, what all of you guys were talking about were were largely human health issues via your different uh, different lenses. Uh, so, Andrea, obviously, sea level. Who cares about sea level rise if we didn't build hard structures next to the sea line? Um, Chris, um, I, I'm saying who cares uh, in a, in a generic sense. Um, Chris, similarly with fish distribution, um, we care a lot because uh, we rely on it so strongly. Um, Barry uh, alluded to uh, the fact that organisms are, uh, uh, diverse ecosystems are a key to survival. And as we've seen for, from, uh, from the SARS-CoV-2, the, the coronavirus, the loss of that biodiversity and climate change have added together to uh, cause this global pandemic, basically, along with human activities. Um, and, you know, and Paul noted in his talk about the need to uh, to respond in uh, in ad ad adaptive ways to climate change impacts on health. So um, I welcome everybody, um, and I've been so impressed to see your guys' talks. I was excited when I was discussing this with you a couple months ago, and then to see your talks, I I'm doubly excited to to enjoy uh, this evening. So thank you all. Uh, I'd like to start off with a uh, a couple general questions, and I'll just kind of go around the rounds. And for all of those participating, we have the Goldschmidt um, app, so you can um, we can continue the discussion in there. It's actually quite active right at this very moment with a couple people um, on it from this session. But also, please um, type in in chat, and we have a, a, a great student helper uh, who will uh, translate those uh, those questions back to us uh, for the panel. Um, and um, Barry Sinervo, you're not seeing him here, and I'll probably be reading his responses. He has uh, some laryngitis now, so he's not going to join um, uh, by 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 microphone. But um, he's a very quick typer to questions. Mm -hmm. I've noticed. So, um, uh, what what I was struck by, we had this conversation earlier today, but I want to I wanted to return to one topic that I was uh, really intrigued by that you guys all brought up is. How do you communicate um, uh, an issue like climate change impacts that are really critical to su the survival of our modern lifestyle? How do you communicate those without panic? How do you communicate those in a way that's actionable by people so they actually feel like they can do something ab about it? Um, and a number of your guys' presentations uh, uh, touched on that. But I'm gonna start off with you, Andrea, since you're the first one on the presentation realm. How do you uh, approach that? Right. Well, I think a certain amount of panic is good because you do want people to be concerned. So it's always this question of striking the right balance. And that can be really hard because you never really know where someone is coming from when they approach this uh, topic and what their past experience is. And so it's hard when you're addressing, say, like a large room full of people. You're not going to get it right for everyone, probably. Uh, so I think it's it's always a question for me of striking the right balance of concern to say, look, we need to worry, but on the other hand, also have some hope and say there's something we can do about it, and you can be active and participate in that solution too. And it's not um, 
there's not just one answer to all these issues that we're talking about today. And I think a lot of people feel like they don't know how they can contribute or that they don't have the right skills. But we need everyone's skill set, you know, whether you're a banker or a filmmaker, or, you know, all these people can uh, participate because things are going to, all of those things are going to have to change in terms of climate change. You can tell your story through film or bankers can think about how we should be investing differently, right? So everyone has skills that they can bring to bear to this problem if they just change their mindset about it. So uh, thank you. And, and do you see, Andrea, do you see, um, do you see individual positivity? When, when you talk to audiences, for example, you do a lot of public speaking, do, do, I mean, do you see uh, gloom and doom or do you also see some sparks of glimmer of like, oh, I, I can actually be part of the solution? Yeah, I do pe see people who are very empowered and excited to go out and do things. I also see the kind of deer in headlights of, wow, I didn't realize it was this bad. You know, I knew about sea level rise, but I didn't quite realize how urgent the issue is. And I, I think it's good to push them into that realm of understanding. Um, but I do see a lot of people who are, are ready to act too. And I think, again, that's partly a function of where they're coming from when they approach this, if they're ready to take that step, right? Uh, great, uh, thank you. And um, Barry, uh, Barry responds, um, the time scale is the future, so it's a little bit difficult as we have to start now. Uh, we should have started 20 years ago, and this is what I hear often is um, when uh, when uh, Jim Hansen, James Hansen, spoke uh, in front of Congress in uh, 1988 about the the threats of climate change. That's pretty much when we should have started. Um, uh, so it. And then uh, Barry continues, so it is a start, starting to become dire, but I think a controlled measured discussion of the hope involved in what we can achieve if we all cooperate and change the future of climate change. And the key is the children, uh, yeah, and which is what we discussed earlier, the children who will inherit the earth uh, need to remain positive that we can change and they do need us to set up the future for them. And yeah, that's a, that's exactly right, Barry. Uh, you know, I see that, um, we, 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 everyone on this call, are the people in quote unquote power because we vote and we have money. Um, but it, the children are the ones who are going to um, going to be living with this. So, um, uh, Chris, what what are your thoughts about that? I mean, do, what do you see in terms of um, of uh, of how you communicate about, and particularly you 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 discuss fisheries? How do you communicate to people? Maybe particularly the the fisheries managements. Or, or or communities without inducing panic? Yeah, I, I think in addition to sort of exposing the problem and sort of trying to communicate what the science says about the challenge is, is also trying to translate what the science says about the, uh, the opportunities for solutions um, to, to mitigating that challenge or to, um, to overcoming it. So in addition to talking about the problem, trying to also um, emphasize and identify um, the, the opportunities for actions that we take now to 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 reduce that impact. Could you, um, speaking of that, I'll stick with you, Chris, for a second. What are mm -hmm. some examples? Yeah, um, so I I think um, I think some examples in the fisheries world um, are um, to to let's see. Um, so one one example right now that I'm working on is on the, the California Dungeness crab fishery, which is really threatened by um, uh, harmful algal blooms, which produce a toxin that accumulates in the crab tissue and then presents a public health risk to consumers. Um, and and this the harmful algal blooms are becoming more and more common, and it's becoming an increasing challenge. But there are all sorts of um, opportunities for innovating in the ways that we are able to. Uh, forecast the occurrence of those um, harmful algal blooms um, and how we can use all sorts of new quantitative tools for, for simulating different strategies for um, 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 responding to those risks and employing like really dynamic ocean management. Um, so I think in, in talking to sort of managers about, about this challenge, trying to um, um, sort of Identify this challenge and then and then and then present a framework for for testing uh, solutions for approaching that challenge. Great. Uh, no, thanks, Chris. Paul, I, I'm going to ask this question um, slightly differently of you um, because I, I view um, the the um, Cook County, the Chicago heat wave, and the mortalities, the heat related mortalities related to that, as a good example of 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 how 
how a city can respond to a crisis situation, right? So this was a situation uh, where there was a uh, hundred, 700 and some excess deaths because of this heat wave. Um, largely, of course, those who are least able, the most vulnerable populations. Um, how do communities uh, uh, build their way or talk their way uh, toward better outcomes in terms of, of health and climate change? Yeah, great question, Gabe. So at least what we've been seeing from the climate communication side, looking at uh, research on climate and health communication, um, what works best in communicating to the public is a simple, clear messages that are repeated often by a variety of trusted sources. So we try to provide that information. We put it out ourselves. Our partners like the World Health Organization or Health Canada also put out that same exact information, the same consistent talking points. Um, and then groups such as nurses and local public health officials put that out. Um, and, and I think that that communication helps to educate the public. Um, and what you're pointing out, for example, with the Chicago heat wave is how once a community has actually experienced an impact of climate change, uh, they might be more likely to get action on the ground, adaptation action, mitigation action, um, policy changes. So for in that Chicago example, they didn't have a heat response plan. Well, they do now. And there's been bad heat waves after that with far fewer public health consequences. Um, so sometimes I think it's very unfortunate that something has to happen um, before local leaders will, will actually uh, take concrete steps to protect people. Um, but we do see that over and over. We see it in areas that experience flooding more frequently um, or are having worse air pollution. You know, once they're actually seeing these consequences, uh, then sometimes that's the impetus for action to happen. No, that's, that's, yeah, that, that's interesting. And, and, um, you know, uh, in a sense, what uh, Andrea in, a, in an earlier discussion, we were talking about tipping points and you don't notice one until you're past it and you say, oh, that was the tipping point. Um, you know, sometimes uh, it's almost like systems have to have that shock first so that you learn that lesson. Um, could you describe, Andrea, um, what, what you mean by, by, by that? By the, so Paul mentioned the shock. So that was a cook, that Chicago heat wave. And guess what? They develop an action plan immediately afterwards, and so they have uh, resilience built in. Could you develop what that might look or discuss what that might look like in terms of sea level rise? Right. So right now you see a lot of uh, local community action in coastal communities that are being more frequently flooded just by normal high tides. And because they're experiencing this problem, they're realizing, oh, we have to do something about it. And from my perspective as a science communicator, I get really frustrated by that. But I've been telling you this for a long time, right? This has been coming. And so the challenge of, you know, where I bang my head against the wall is how do I get people to move to that point of action, the tipping point, the action tipping point, if you will, uh, before the threat actually arrives, when we know for sure it's coming, right? So, you know, all the sea level rise projections, doesn't matter which curve you pick, they're all going up and they're all accelerating. So for sure, we know there's gonna be more frequent flooding in the future. And so then, then I get frustrated when people only act after that disaster has happened. So, you know, some of the places that have been most active in the planning now are New Orleans, which got hit hard by Katrina or the New York City area after Sandy came through. And that's great, all, all of the initiatives that they're putting in place. But what I would like to see is that happen on a broader scale, knowing that that's going to be affecting all over our coastlines, right? Um, so that's, I think, one of the real challenges is, is trying to figure out ways to compel people that this is a good investment. It will cost less to deal with this problem now than if we wait for that disaster to strike. So I'm going to stick with you for a second, Andrea. What, what, um, are there coastal air, coastal regions which simply have to be abandoned to sea level rise? Yes, they will be. So, and that that's a a hard truth that I I do try to deliver in my public talks. I don't shy away from that because I think um, people need that dose of reality. So, for example, the average elevation in the Florida Keys is three feet above sea level, 
And by the end of the century in that region, they're predicting more than three feet of sea level rise. So um, there's a certain inevitability to what's gonna happen here. And then what, and the problem is kind of wrapping your head around that and saying, okay, if, if this is our future, we can argue about exactly when this is gonna happen and when tipping points are going to occur, but maybe we should think about how we want this to play out, right? How, if we could manage that retreat somehow, rather than waiting for the heart attack, could you change your diet to prevent the heart attack from happening, right? You can think of all these different analogies in that sense. And, and in a way it is analogous to, to human life. You know, at some point in our lives, we all um, accept, uh, we realize of the issue of mortality, that at some point we're gonna die, but we don't stop living, right? When, once we figure that out. So just because this thing is looming in our future, doesn't mean that we can't take some control of that situation. So a phrase that I fall back on a lot is that the future is not just a place that we get to go to, it's a place that we can create together. Uh, yeah, outstanding. Yeah, and I see these, the, the various emission scenarios, um, right, and then the temperature projections, which then lead to sea level rise projections. Um, I, I think the public sometimes see that as like a whole range of uncertainties about what the science tells us instead of the actuality, which is it's a range of uncertainties about how we're going to act, right? Exactly, our human behavior. So we can take control. And that's that's exactly the point. Some people see that that's our destiny. It's like, well, we can choose a different path, right? And that's our choice to make, right? Right. And, and Chris, uh, Andrea brought up the thing, the, the issue of managing, ma managing um, through change and you know as a person who's been focusing a ton on fisheries and you know you're showing how uh how dynamically how fisheries uh, both um natural fisheries i don't know if you if that's your the correct term but uh, and aquaculture will have to change so we can manage aquaculture to some extent right by probably changing species and so forth uh, the natural fisheries probably not so much um, um how how do you view the the future of management of fisheries resources uh and, and how do you communicate that to people yeah that's a really good question so i think it, it sounds like there's commonalities across all of our disciplines where we want to switch from being uh, sort of reactive to uh being preemptive and and not just responding to uh and learning about crises as they happen for the first time um so uh, uh an example recently was um Atlantic mackerel, which is a big fishery in European waters, shifted its distribution from uh, historically being in Norway, and it moved up and into sort of Iceland and Denmark um, managed waters. Um, and because there wasn't a history of cooperation between those different countries about how to manage the stock when it's shifting like that, it led to um, sort of gross over-exploitation of this historically uh, well-managed um, managed fishery. And, and, and so that's something that we've been, you know, sort of reactively responding to, but that's a clear message for the future in terms of the types of um, international cooperation that's gonna be necessary between countries as um, stocks shift from the tropics uh, poleward in order to ensure that good management happens along, uh, along that trajectory and that we're maximizing uh, the ability of the ocean to provide food uh, for people. Yeah, and 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 what really struck me in your uh, in your talk was just um, the severe shifts in in um, in fisheries production away from uh, the equatorial region and toward the polar region, obviously, which um, which requires this delicate balancing act of um, internet. Sometimes requires an international cooperation on some of these issues, which I'll get at in a moment because uh, we had a th our conversation about that earlier today was was really deep. Uh, Barry Sinervo notes that many communities in Brazil rely on the ecosystem services of nearby forests. So Barry's talk was specifically about um, the decline in, in um, uh, lizards and salamanders as well as birds and others um, due to climate change and largely their, their thermal control and, and discussing the need to protect large swaths and actually reforest large, large swaths of tropical, uh, tropical forests to uh, as a buffer against, again, a solution against this temperature change. Um, uh, Barry noted that uh, Brazil has a network of farms that grow produce for the city or town. The, the health of these farms rely on the Amazonian forest to be intact, such that the evapotranspiration, again, this, uh, this uh, 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 borrowed effect from the forest in general, 
Uh, the evapotranspiration from the forest triggers the, the daily rains that flow into the farmland. This is an ecosystem service key to resilience of local communities. And, you know, these ecosystem services, uh, we, we seem to have forgotten that we, we certainly severely undervalue them. Here at IU, we have Eleanor Ostrom, who is, uh, she's, she's passed away, but she was a Nobel Prize winner in economics, who was uh, sort of the, who headed up the, the first discussions of putting value on ecosystem services for environmental stability. So um, this is key. Um, so we do have a question from um, the guru behind this entire uh, process, Adina Peytan, who's one of the steering committee uh, organizers, has been tireless in, in hurting the cats. And she asked, um, these are all global problems, but do they affect different populations differently? And what I would love to hear um, you guys each talk about is um, whether you want to cast it as inequity, as racism, as what or or um, poor versus uh, rich countries. Um, how do how do these issues play out um, in in uh, communities with different resources? In this case, Paul, uh, for the national perspective, I'm going to start with you first. Yeah, sure. And and thanks for that question, Adina. And that's the, a really good point. We know there's copious amounts of evidence that climate change affects people inequitably. And we see certain communities that are more highly affected by climate change. Um, and it tends to be poor communities, communities of color um, that are experiencing uh, the health impacts of climate change. Um, and the ironic part of it is it's typically the communities that have not contributed much to climate change, especially on a global scale. Um, so the the countries and communities that have uh, contributed less to greenhouse gases are feeling the brunt of climate change right now. Um, and at least within the United States, there's a lot of evidence, for example, on heat waves um, and uh, flooding that they tend to impact the poorest communities and communities of color. So we actually base what we do around that. You know, at, at the US CDC, we provide funding and technical assistance to health departments, and they're required to do vulnerability assessments. They're required to look at which communities are going to be the most impacted and to base their climate adaptation planning around that. Um, and it's not just CDC that does that. Our, a lot of our international colleagues um, follow that kind of same path of uh, requiring that resources be spent on the communities that are being most impacted. Um, I would also mention that the American Public Health Association, which is the largest nonprofit health association in the world, they their climate change work is all in their Center for Climate Health and Equity. So they only have three words in that title, and equity is one of the, th the three words. Um, so it, it really has been a focus. I think it's absolutely a necessary focus. Um, and it ties into, you know, a history of environmental justice um, and uh, climate injustices and the impacts it has on, on health are just a continuation of what we've already seen. Um, yeah, exactly. And um, Paul, you mentioned something on the earlier webinar, which really struck me, is that some, um, some public health departments are just severely under-resourced with simply people. Um, and so that kind of builds in uh, it could have the potential to build in failure to respond to extreme events if they're under resourced in terms of public health officials. Is is who who's in charge of that? <laughs> well, uh, I guess I'll, I'll start by saying there certainly are in larger cities. You know, some have robust public health departments, um, but most people in the U.S. don't live in in a large city. They might live in the metropolitan area or suburbs or a rural area, mm -hmm. um, but most people in the United States are actually covered by a smaller health department. Um, and that's data coming from the National Association of County and City Health Officials. Um, so most health departments do not have an environmental health department. They certainly don't have any dedicated staff uh, working on climate change or health impacts of climate change. Maybe they've thought about a heat plan, you know, like the example we talked about in Chicago or a larger city where they have the resources for that. Um, but at a smaller health department, it might only be a handful of people and they're doing their things that are required by law, like restaurant inspections, um, things like that. Uh, and they might not be thinking about, hey, maybe we should be planning for vector-borne diseases because guess what? Ticks are moving into our area and we're having Lyme disease now that we didn't used to have to, didn't used to have. 
but they don't necessarily have the expertise and the staff to to deal with that. Um, the good news is we do provide funding. Um, there, there's funding from uh, foundations as well on climate and health in the United States. There's funding uh, internationally from groups uh, like Health Canada and some other national uh, public health institutes providing funding in their countries. Um, so it, it's getting better. Um, there's a lot of work that's now being done on the local level with that funding. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it, at least in my opinion, health departments are, are pretty severely underfunded. And um, this issue uh, of protecting their constituents from health effects of climate change might not be a top priority. No, I, I hear you. So, so thanks, Paul. Um, Andrea, I'm going to stay kind of uh, national here, uh, talking about communities, particularly those who are most vulnerable to, uh, to the impacts of sea level change and flooding. And you've thought about this and written quite a bit about this. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. Yeah, so I, I again, thank you, Dina, for the question. I think we really can't address these issues related to climate change without thinking about this issue of intersectionality and how these already marginalized communities are bearing the brunt of it. There was a recent um, analysis of flood insurance data in the United States that includes both inland and coastal flooding, which showed that black neighborhoods are disproportionately harmed by this more frequent flooding. And again, this is this systemic um, process of the way these neighborhoods were defined and the redlining and the areas of lower elevation, you know, being uh, going in what are now the poorer communities. Um, so this, we can't, address this without addressing also at the same time these issues related to systemic racism and all the social inequity. So the example I gave in the talk, for those of you who have had a chance to look at it, is thinking about uh, building seawalls and raising roads. So for example, there are some communities in South Florida that are already doing this, but they've put out bonds and the wealthy communities have enough money to do this. But when you build a seawall or you raise the road, the water that would have been there has now been displaced and pushed away into the communities that couldn't afford to do it. So you've actually made the problem even worse for those communities who can least afford to adapt to this problem. Um, so it's not just a problem of the inequity, but also making it worse when uh, you're you know, keeping those resources to yourself. So if you're only dealing with these problems at the local level and relying on those local finances, that's a big problem. Um, if you don't have any state leadership on the issue, which has been a problem in Florida for a long time, and that's where I've been living for the last nine years, which is why I keep bringing it up. Um, or at the federal level, in terms of coastal planning, then you're leaving it up to the resources at the local level. So only the ones that have the money will be able to respond. So while it's important because local communities will need to respond differently and you can't use the same plan everywhere. So you need to think locally, but it also has to be a top-down process of distributing the resources to help resolve some of these inequi inequities along the way. Uh, exactly. I mean, and this issue of of the fact that um, the only way to deal with inequity is to uh, is is to is to also look at the systemic uh, drivers. A lot of them are the top down resource allocations, right? Right. Exactly. Um, now, Chris, from I, I'd like you to have you shift because Barry's. I'm going to read Barry's in a second, but the international perspective. Uh, I, I, all of you guys could speak on this, I'm sure, but. Chris, um, you work on global fisheries, really. Uh, and, and what are your perspectives about uh, inequities, largely like national, the, the, the developing countries versus the developed countries? Yeah, um, unfortunately, the patterns are really sort of comparable and ubiquitous as, as in these other systems where um, tropical developing countries are forecast to be the hardest hit uh, by climate change. And they're also the ones uh, whose livelihoods and, and sources of food and nutrition are, are extremely tied to, to ocean ecosystems and fisheries. And there's, uh, you know, even this sort of like perverse scenario where the, the poleward countries that have created the sort of climate problem are the ones that are going to be inheriting these uh, resources as they, as they move forward. So I think it really um, highlights the responsibility of those, um, um, of those poleward countries to, to take leadership in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and and it's also really interesting to me because it's not it's even in the even the, in the U.S. this is a this is a, a challenge um, where uh, like fisher folk with smaller boats are less able to respond to shifts in the resources than people with larger boats. Um, 
There's evidence of that on the U.S. East Coast. Um, and there's also lots of evidence from, from Alaska that fishers with access to, to a greater number of permits, so whose livelihoods are more diversified, are more um, resilient to impacts of climate change. Um, so, you know, policies that are really targeting uh, the, the poorer fishers with smaller boats or with fewer uh, permits are going to be really necessary for addressing these inequities, even in the, even in the U.S. So thanks, Chris, for that. And, and I was wondering, do you have any ideas of, I don't know, this might not be your specific field, but any ideas of policy interventions that could assist, could aid in equity in, the, in, in maritime food production? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I think uh, a lot of this sort of like inter international cooperation that I was talking about earlier uh, in terms of incentivizing um, you know, countries not to overfish their resources as, as exiting their waters is going to require sort of new structures for allowing things like 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 um, like side payments to um, um, to negotiate that sort of um, um, that behavior. Um, so I think I think that that might be one policy intervention that's really helpful. Oh, great, thank you. And there's a, a, an odd thing that I ran across when I was working in the State Department about. Um, I think there was a, a this odd triangle of um, abalone overfishing in South Africa. So abalone were used as sort of a a, uh, a shuttle for drug money in some way in in uh, in Africa. I, am I making that up, or have you heard of anything like this? I, I have I have never heard anything like that. I'm going to Google it immediately after this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the the issue is it was like a way to launder money. Apparently, okay. was uh, uh, illegal abalone fishery. But um, you know, mm -hmm. who knows uh, how widespread it was. But so I'd like to. Barry has answered, responded in this way, and I'm just going to read his response. Um, let's take a local perspective, uh, local to North America and Mesoamerica. The countries in Central America are profoundly impacted by climate change. Those local farmers have been impacted dramatically by an intensification of the El Nino. Uh, which we have seen, uh, which interacts with the um, North Atlantic Oscillation to drive very warm periods. We're also very dry periods in that part of uh, Central America and Mexico. This effect is how we discovered the ongoing uh, extinction of reptiles, but it was also causing failure of farms, and we are now seeing the northward migration of the farmers trying to get into the U.S. to escape the climate catastrophe. I would argue much like um, the Syrian refugee situation, which is at least initially sparked by climate change. These extreme events are happening all over the world, but concentrated toward the tropics. Again, like Chris mentioned, uh, this kind of equatorial um, deficit that we're seeing. Years ago, the lizard extinctions in the mountainous regions of Mexico, uh, and the lizard extinctions um, foretold the plight of Central American farmers from the same climate change impacts on ENSO and uh, North, American, uh, North Atlantic uh, oscillation interaction. Uh, we'll only see an intensification of this uh, this migration driven by, uh, but human migration driven by climate change poleards uh, to developed countries. Barry, um, that's yeah, that's spot on, uh, and it's it's um, it's it's interesting. And and what I'm particularly intrigued at from the international landscape is how do you build robust um, international partnerships or agreements that will buffer the the poorer countries. Uh, who again were least responsible for some of this issue from the most pain, uh, and 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 maybe we can touch back on that uh, a little bit later in this discussion. But um, I'm going to ask a couple very specific questions for the panelists uh, and go around. Uh, and and I'm going to start, um, uh, Chris, with you specifically. Uh, I know that I, I teach a little bit about ocean acidification and um, and uh, farmed oysters and some of the, the the consequences, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, of uh, of uh, uh, oyster or, oyster farmers. Um, what's what kind of solutions do we see implemented, or at least mitigation strategies do we see implemented by in in uh, mariculture or aquaculture to climate change or ocean acidification? Yeah, that, that that's a great question. Um, so just to sort of get everyone on the same page, um, ocean aquaculture is basically the farming of ocean organisms out in um, out in the water someplace, 
Um, and uh, uh, although in agriculture it's been very common to to breed species for you know favorable properties like fast growth or um, like environmental tolerance, that practice is is almost never happens in aquaculture. Only about 10% of global aquaculture stocks are selectively bred for something like uh, fast growth or 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 tolerance to ocean acidification or or ocean warming. Um, so there's there's sort of increasing evidence that um, selective breeding programs could um, would be really helpful for for mitigating these these impacts of, of climate change on 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 shell you know shell forming organisms like like oysters or on um, you know fin fish like a, a Atlantic salmon. Um, so so that's um, that's one major thing, and another another major advance that we can make in the aquaculture world is uh, development of tools for identifying sites like locations for aquaculture farms that are the lowest risk um, in terms of um, their vulnerability to climate change, and also in terms of their uh, impacts on ecosystems, or maybe even their ability to provide um, ecosystem services in a targeted way. Uh, no, that's 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 really interesting. I, I know that you know some there has been some response of uh, was that liming um, aquaculture areas like to try to reduce localized pH. Uh, so I, I know that they are monitoring pH pretty carefully because of uh, oyster polyp recruitment or something. I'm not an expert mm -hmm. on this stuff, but th there seems to be some practical solutions that kind of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I don't I do know that they do this this uh, the, the flocculation with clay to try to, uh, to tamp things down. I'm, I'm not quite sure about how how successful it is, but I think probably long term this um, um, sort of siting siting farms and in, in in low risk areas and breeding for for favorable traits is probably one of the better long term solutions. Great, um, thank you. Um, Andrew, I'm going to ask you specifically, um, you are sort of our panelist guru on science communication, um, only because you've really taken it as a, as a big passion of yours and you've devoted uh, you know, a, some, some real efforts and thought to science communication. Um, do, you, do you feel, first of all, and, and this is kind of a, um, a, a straw man, do you feel we're doing an adequate job training young students on science communication, uh, number one? Second, um, how would you go about training the next generation of science communication? Yeah, so that's a great question. And science communication is something that I was never taught really how to do uh, as a student, but it's become a really important uh, part of my career and what and what I do. And I when I talk to a lot of um, early career scientists who are interested in science communication, they're nervous about doing it, thinking that they won't succeed because of doing it. And I actually point out to them that uh, I feel like in large part because of my science communication it did elevate my profile and it really did help my career in the end instead of say sucking time away from it which is i think how a lot of people see it so um there's a lot of work for us to do in terms of educating people and that's something that i have started to spend a long a lot of time doing in my own research group but i'm starting to develop some more formal courses uh, to teach students at different levels how to communicate science and just how to speak about science generally with people, right? So when you go out to a party, how to have a conversation with someone about something scientific in a casual way. And, you know, I got actually asked a question on my prelim, something about this, if you had to sit in someone in a bar and explain evolution to them. And that was, you know, my question that I had to answer. Those are really valuable school uh, skills. And I think it's something that we really need to do a lot more of and not be afraid of talking about science uh, with people. Uh, in our lives, and it's something that I try to do and, and practice regularly, whether I'm riding in a taxi cab with someone and talking to someone or sitting next to someone on a plane. Um, so, I mean, the question of how to do it in terms of teaching, I think there are, are lots of different ways, but ultimately it's about practice. So the more opportunities you give to people to practice those skills, whether it's with other people in the same classroom or going out into their community, um, I, I thought about setting up a little booth at my daughter's soccer games. She does uh, travel soccer with like ask a scientist to like draw people in and start conversations with people who are not the type of people who might come to my talks and walk through the door, right? And that's a challenge too, is trying to gap that bridge of the people who might not normally engage. How do you 
initiate communication with them. And that's a real big challenge that I think we have to address. Um, no, thanks for the thoughts. I'm gonna stick with you just for a second, Andrea. Um, we had a, a comment earlier today on the, on the panel. Uh, how do you deal with science denial? And, and I'm, not, I'm not gonna make you answer science denial. How about just climate denial? How do you do that? How do you, how do you um, interact with audiences where you know it might be a quote unquote rough audience? Um, I've done it a few times where you're talking to professional geologists, for example, and oddly geologists kind of can sometimes doubt the, the, the human role in climate change. How do you deal with that? Yeah, and it's gonna depend on your audience. Like in your case, at least they're scientists, so you can hopefully reason with them through logic, right? Which you can't always do with, uh, with climate denialists. Um, so it's always a challenge for me to kind of um, disengage emotionally because sometimes I've had this reaction like, no, 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 don't you see? And just like jump all over it and I kind of lose the plot. So I, I, I tamp that down and, and try to respond to them thinking maybe this is just a genuine question and let's approach it that way. And even if it isn't, even if they're trying to be antagonistic, there are other people who are listening to your response and to this conversation who can learn something from it and learn how to talk to people about it. And I have had people come up to me at the end and say, that was really helpful. You know, I can do that and take that and talk to these other people in my family and, and try the same thing. But, um, you know, I think there's really, when it comes down to it, some of the polling that's been done, there's only, at least in the, in the United States, something like less than 10% of people who are people you just can't convince at all. They're so entrenched that you're not gonna change their mind. And everyone else is somewhere along this spectrum of, of that you can reason with them and talk to them. One of the things I find that is most uh, effective is actually listening, not talking. And it's listening to what they have to say and listening to them about what they value in their lives and connecting with them over the shared values that you might have and helping them to connect the dots. Here's how climate change or sea level rise, whatever, is going to impact that thing you care about whether it's going out and fishing on the weekend with your friend or you know, whatever it is. Even if you just both have kids, there's something that you can connect about um, because climate change impacts basically every facet of our life. Um, and so you can always find something to talk about. So really, I think one of the most important skills in communicating and in talking with people who are maybe coming with a preconceived notion about climate and climate denial um, is to listen to them as well. That's a good point, and and, and you brought up that that's uh, you brought up earlier that Catherine Hayhoe, who's one of her messages is listen first, you know, and, and you and you mentioned her amazing resource, uh, Global Weirding, which is a series of, uh, of videos, which I, I highly recommend. Um, yes. Paul, I'm going to shift to you again. This is actually a question from uh, the audience. Um, it's kind of directed to Chris a little bit, but I'm going to redirect it to you, Paul, and we'll get Chris's uh, touch on this a little bit. Uh, this question is from Maya Bergman, and it's about um, uh, the 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 um, kind of the disproportionate impact on Native American communities of climate change. And she noted um, the the role of uh, of tr uh, traditional economic uh, traditional ecological knowledge (TEK). And I know we talk about that when I was in the state. We talked about it in the government quite a bit the role that that can have in engaging communities. Can you? Talk about some of the programs that you've seen with Native American uh, populations. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, and um, there's there's a lot of evidence on that uh, on the disproportionate impacts, but also um, the really unique strategies that are used, um, the resiliency strategies and adaptation strategies. Um, we actually uh, just published an article last week looking at heat-related deaths in the United States. And the demographic group that we saw had the highest rate of heat-related deaths was Native Americans. Um, and that's that's over about the past decade and a half. So we know that there are those existing vulnerabilities. And we work closely with the National Indian Health Board. And we actually have provided funding as well as technical assistance out to a number of tribes across the country. Um, and they really have had some some very novel and uh, and unique strategies that incorporate traditional knowledge. Um, just one example that I'll give is uh, from the Swinomish tribe, um, which is in what we currently call Washington State in the United States. Um, and they uh, used um, their kind of local 
knowledge to inform data sets when they were looking for what their biggest impact was. So they basically said, okay, we see how CDC defines health. We see how CDC tells states and cities to look at how climate is affecting your health. That doesn't entirely work for us because we don't think of health in that exact same way. Um, so they actually used some uh, community-based meetings to collect more information on what the impacts were locally and what people were actually worried about and what people perceived as impacting their health and the health of their community. Um, and uh, there's a couple of uh, published papers on that actually, if, if you want more information. Uh, they're described much better in those papers than I'm doing right now. Um, but that's just one example of, of where local knowledge and um, local practices were used to inform uh, climate adaptation strategies. Um, so yeah, it, it is certainly a, a, a vulnerable population and um, a very diverse population. And, and what's affecting one tribe is not going to be the same thing that's affecting a different tribe. So the use of their, um, their belief systems and knowledge is really critical when they're developing their adaptation plans. Uh, no, and, and that's that's uh, that's really interesting to hear. Uh, particularly, I mean, when when you he think about um, another approach to doing research, uh, uh, university researchers tend to do research on communities instead of with communities, right? Um, we have our tools and our knowledge, so we're going to come and, and research on these communities. Sometimes not even leaving them with any answers whatsoever. Um, and and this early engagement, yeah, I've done this a lot of my own work. It's it's enlightened me so much. I didn't even realize that I was asking the wrong question, or I could have been asking a question differently, um, and then had the answer be much more impactful for communities. Um, so no, I think that's really important. I, I've um, skipped out. I'm going to pause on on Barry for a second, beca only because I've accidentally um, asked him a question on the organizers only mode. So I, <laughs> I apologize for that. I'll ask him the question for uh, the panelists as well. But I'm going to um, switch over. Um, Chris, what are your thoughts? This was actually originally addressed towards you, I think, because uh, some Native American populations, uh, first world populations, are you know very dependent on seafood uh, for their their diet. So, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, certainly. Um, so, I think there are a lot of places where um, um, sort of really embracing that local ecological knowledge can lead to really, really excellent um, sort of coupled ecological and socioeconomic outcomes. Um, and, and sort of we, we talked about this in terms of establishing like, like rights-based management programs where a fishing community um, gets the rights over you know, some proportion of the, the, the catch or over some area, and then they get to manage it according to their um, um, sort of own um, management strategies. And these have been really effective at aligning sort of conservation and economic incentives because um, um, now uh, the community owns that that sort of that that resource, and it's only valuable if it persists into the future. Um, um, so I think there 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 are lots of places where um, um, local ecological knowledge not only needs to be like used, but like um, um, enhanced and um, in terms of how how much it can get used. Um, and I think it's also like um, uh, really evolving to include, um, you know, like um, uh, really like scientific knowledge as well. I just read a paper recently about um, um, how there's no state-run biotoxin monitoring program um, for shellfish in Alaska. And uh, 17 tribal communities came together and have established their own biotoxin monitoring program um, um, for monitoring harmful algal blooms in 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 uh, farms that they've been farming for 10,000 years. Um, so um, uh, that's that's pretty that's pretty amazing. And I just want to say, Chris, that's amazing that you you mentioned that specific example because we work with the Sitka tribe in Alaska um, and provide them some technical assistance on that. So it really is it's so interdisciplinary you know we're coming at it from the health perspective you're thinking about it from the fisheries perspective mm -hmm. it's all one health and when we talk about these impacts of climate change um it, it's really how it affects affects humans and our way of life um and whether we're talking about infrastructure or food sources or you know it's all the same thing cool that's great um 
uh, Barb Dutro is just reminding us that um, as a follow-up to your comments, Andrea, um, uh, there will be more strategies on communicating controversial topics in theme 15E. So wait around till Friday. It's teaching and communicating in the age of social media and a talk highlighting communicating strategies by uh, Nikki Kraus, uh, reasons that communication fail and succeed, a plug for 15E. So, uh, okay. You, uh, Barb, it's 15 E's been plugged, I, and I, I look forward to seeing it. Um, uh, Barry has responded. I actually asked a specific question to Barry Sinervo about um, about bird populations and bird population decline because um, he has some experience with that. Um, Barry um, uh, says that birds are beginning to go locally extinct in the hottest places of the planet, like the Mojave Desert or Death Valley. Local populations are winking out. Birds, however, are quite uh, quite versatile um, and can fly away and establish new populations. So relative to all the other vertebrates, birds are going to fare quite well. Amphibians and reptiles do not have this luxury and are going locally extinct. Um, mammals are intermediate in that regard. So that's interesting. Uh, Barry would consider the birds maybe least vulnerable, um, uh, obviously uh, reptiles, amphibians, most and mammals somewhere in between. Um, and so much of it has to do with thermal regulation. That's so interesting. Thanks, Barry. That's that's uh, that, that's really fascinating. Now, Adina, I'm, I'm going to ask um, I'm going to ask uh, that Adina be unmuted. Uh, so, Alana, if you can unmute Adina, because she has a question for us. I think I'm unmuted now. I wanted, to, you know, you discussed about when uh, involving communities from the start rather than coming with solutions to them, which I totally agree with. And one thing that I'm struggling with is at what stage do you start that? Do you contact them when you write a proposal? Do you do it once you get funded and try to plan? At what stage do you actually incorporate the, the community in deciding how to plan your science? Excellent. So, Andrea, could you start off with that one? Yeah, sure. Um, and this is definitely a challenge because I know a lot of people have put in a lot of investment, you know, developing relationships and working with people and then maybe not getting something funded. And so there's always this issue, you know, how do you go about doing this effectively and in the right way? Because you do want to have the community engaged from the beginning. So one piece of advice is to work with community organizers and organizations that already have those connections locally so that you're not having to do it um, from scratch. And so to the extent that you can tap into those organizations who are already there, that will help a lot. Um, another possibility, if uh, in the US, a lot of the state universities have these extension uh, branches and that's definitely a great model to work through because there are local people from the university say in each county or wherever they have them distributed and so you can tap into them and they know the local people and and work in that way through that network that already exists and it may exist have different purposes usually in functions but they still have those community connections and I actually see that as a, a really big possibility moving into the future that we could tap into those extension branches much better with a lot of these issues related to climate change and adaptation. And there's a real opportunity there, I think, moving forward. That's a great idea. Thank you. I've never thought about reaching out to the extensions. Yeah, and we can. <laughs> oh, I, I know, and particularly in universities that have the C grant groups, they have a lot of right. extensions. USDA, they have extensions. Yep. Yeah, that's that's right. And and Barry Barry responds, I rely on local collaborators to contact local communities um, during our field expeditions, say to the Amazon and get them engaged. We have tried this option in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and France. The local collaborators are key. Uh, that have the local connections and understand how to use their connections to move things forward. So I get, I think Barry's answer to you and mine would be too, because I do a lot of community engaged research is start even before you've uh, completely formulated the research questions, because the questions might change um, based on that input. Now, Paul, um, and then I'm going to get to you, um, Chris, next, but Paul, uh, your program actually 
effectively engages communities, right, to deal with solutions. So where does that play? When, when you've seen your, um, your funded, you, you fund universities as well, when you see those researchers, how do you, um, at what stage do you try to get them to connect with communities? Yeah, so the, the majority of our funding actually goes out to health departments, um, both at the state level, uh, the local county or city level, the tribal level, and the territorial level. Um, so from the federal perspective, they kind of are our stakeholders. And then from their perspective, the people living in their communities are the stakeholders. Um, so kind of how we approach this is we definitely encourage community-based participatory research um, and we don't require uh, any specific outcomes or a focus on any type of climate hazard. We have a framework that can help provide uh, data and decision-making tools. Um, and that's called the BRACE framework, and I, I cover that in my recorded talk. But we don't require them. We don't say you need to work on um, coastal flooding or you need to develop a heat adaptation plan. That really needs to be the community's decision. Um, and the health departments usually are pretty well positioned to work with community-based organizations. Um, when we are working with academic institutions on this topic, what we what there's been a lot of discussion about is making sure that it's not just a checkbox. You know, when you're applying for funding and you say, "Yep, we we talked to such and such an organization," like that that um, is certainly not the way to go. Um, but rather that there is actual buy-in and even ownership from the local communities. And I know that can be pretty difficult from an academic side because you're worried about what your funder needs. You're worried about the deliverables. Um, but uh, in a lot of the discussions that I've seen, um, especially with the focus on health equity, it's that some of that ownership, even some of the data needs to be given up. And I think that that is of particular concern when you're dealing with a community that has been traditionally exploited. So um, even if there's a perception that an outside researcher is coming in, doing something and then leaving, um, even if that's not the case, but if there's perception, that's that's not gonna go over very well. Um, so uh, from our program, we don't have specific requirements on what has to be done. And that's kind of how we approach it. The funding goes out. Um, there certainly are like logistical metrics they have to report to us, but it's, it's up to the local communities to use the data to work with us. We'll provide them with data to say, hey, what are our local concerns and how are we going to address them? So that's been a pretty good strategy, I think. Um, and again, I realize it's it's pretty different in academia when you're, you're trying to keep your funders happy. Um, but you also want to keep the communities happy and make sure that what you're doing is actually having an impact. Yeah, that's right, Paul. And I'm going to throw that as a big challenge to all the academics out there, including several of us on this webinar, is that the academic system it is not um, well suited to promote um, the slow, long development of community engaged opportunities, right? Um, the tenure clock is not very amenable to that. Um, it's very amenable to like slow development of brand new high tech equipment but not so much to, to developing genuine um, community engagement uh, opportunities. So that's a, that's a challenge to the academic communities to do better. Uh, similarly, as Andrea would agree, science communication um, has to be valued more than simply um, number of nature publications, but that's probably a conversation for another day. Um, uh, so uh, we're, I'm just gonna do a final round and I'm sorry I shortchanged a teeny bit on that, uh, Chris, because we only have like a minute and a half left. Final last words of what makes you optimistic. So Barry, be thinking about this. What makes you optimistic about the future of climate change uh, in for land and sea? Chris, why don't you start? Sure, I, I think what makes me optimistic is that we're just uh, sort of living, we're, we're encountering this problem in a really exciting era where we have more data than we've ever had before from you know ocean observing systems and satellites. Uh, we have more computing power and technical capacity than we've ever had before. Uh, and so I think there's really opportunity to sort of innovate in, in terms of our ability to um, 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 come up with solutions to these really challenging problems. Uh, that, no, that's great. Um, Paul, what, 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 what's your positives? Um, it's, it's definitely the passion I see, especially among younger generations. You know, the, the topic of climate change is becoming something that is 
affecting people's lives directly. And guess what? The younger people are noticing this um, and they're passionate about it and they're looking for careers in it. So I think we have people that are going to be highly engaged um, in it and we're going to reach a, a good tipping point on that. Great. Thank you. And Barry says, I'm optimistic if we can get the local people figuring out their local problems, but then share these solutions, we might be able to find a way forward. We share these things across the globe and to build a brighter, meaning cooler future, which is interesting. <laughs> so Andrea, you're going to get the last word. What makes you optimistic? I think there's been a lot more conversation and activism around climate change just in the last several years. And especially, again, this movement with the youth has been really key part of that. So I'm very excited to see that uh, going forward. So I think there's a lot to be hopeful for because talking about it is really the first step in, in taking action. And with this experience of the global pandemic, I think people have seen play out in real time that uh, there can be a different outcome if we choose to take different actions. And so I think that will be an important global lesson for all of us moving forward. Yeah, and, and, I, and I appreciate you you um, wrap it up with that because um, you know the pandemic has um, has had almost, almost zero positives except for uh, you know, maybe our understanding that that um, if, if we can deal with this, we can deal with see these these other things like climate change. You know, and the pandemic taught us that oh, air pollution does not have to stay with us. It's actually a lot of our own actions um, which are are easily solved. So. Um, all of you guys, it's, it's been a, a phenomenal second conversation of the day. Us East Coasters are thinking, okay, it's yeah, it's we're 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 ready for bed soon. Uh, you West Coaster uh, Chris are thinking, okay, now it's ready for a, a beer in lieu of the happy hour at Goldschmidt. Yeah, <laughs> I have no idea what time it is there in New Zealand, but I'm sure it's. <laughs> So thank you all. Um, uh, I, I'm going to wrap this up before we get kicked out by GoToMeeting. I really appreciate that. And and uh, and Barry Barry Sinervo says also thanks so much for for a great meeting, everybody. So uh, thanks. And thank you to the organizers yeah. all. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks, Adina. Yeah, Adina, big claps for yes. you. <laughs> and thank you, Alana, for uh, for for helping us out. Thank you all. I am just organizing. You did the work. <laughs> Great.